حبيب الله رسول الله حبيب الله الله our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he wanted humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيد الأولين والآخرين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين My dear viewers, welcome to another live edition of Gardens of the Pious and mashallah today's episode is number 518 in the Blessed Seers of Riyadh al-Salihin by Imam Nawawi, may Allah have mercy on him and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless this gathering and enable us to finish the entire a collection of Riyadh al-Salihin, insha'Allah, hopefully. Um, today, we will resume the second episode in chapter number uh, 236, which deals with the, uh, the virtues of freeing the slaves. And uh, in the last episode, we barely tackled one ayah. But today, insha'Allah, we'll begin with the first hadith, hadith number 1300. And 58. It's a beautiful hadith, highly sound, agreed upon its authenticity, and it is uh, narrated by the great companion Abu Hurairah radiallahu an. So, an Abi Hurairah radiallahu anhu qal, qal li Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man a'taqa raqabatan muslimatan, a'taqa Allahu bi kulli udwin minhu, udwan minhu fin nar, حتى فرجه بفرجه. In this hadith, Abu Hurairah, may Allah be pleased with him, said, the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said to me, whoever sets free a Muslim slave, Allah will deliver from the fire of hell every limb of his body in return for every limb of the servant's body, even his private parts. The hadith is, as I said, a sound hadith agreed upon its authenticity. Well, so, before I begin by explaining the hadith, I would like to share with you that this hadith had been said almost 1500 years ago. And the ayah which we discussed in the previous episode with regards to the virtues of freeing the slaves have been revealed almost 1500 years ago. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was commissioned with the prophethood, he was sent in a society where not just this society in the peninsula or the Arab and the Bedouins, uh, that slavery was the norms, but also worldwide, in the Persian Empire, in the Roman Empire, uh, in Egypt, uh, in Abyssinia, everywhere, slaves were uh, all over the world and the resources of slavery were many and the strategy of Islam to eliminate anything that Allah the Almighty wants to eliminate is not through the theory of shock and awe because it does not work it simply doesn't work look how over years Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, utilized the uh, withdrawal, the gradual withdrawal technique in order to eliminate alcohol and intoxicants from the Arabic society and then from the Muslim society at large. Whereas Aisha radiallahu anha narrated that if among the first revelation, like in Mecca, that Allah the Almighty said, oh, you believe, do not drink, people would have said, we're not interested in this religion. Why? لا نترك الشراب أبدا لا نترك الخمر أبدا there is no way that we can quit drinking so initially Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discussed that 
alcohol and intoxicants al khamr has some good things in it and bad and the bad is greater than what is good in al khamr yes you make profit out of selling it but it has huge side effects keeping the person intoxicated unaware of what is going on until gradually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bottom line he judged in Surah Al-Ma'idah it is eternally forbidden likewise there are a lot of things have been eliminated from the practices of the Muslim society gradually because they were born and raised finding these practices as a part of their cultural norms like you know a person can marry 10, 20, 100 there is no limit you can afford it enjoy it uh, a person whenever his father dies if he was married to another woman or two or three he doesn't only inherit his wealth he inherits those women stepmothers will be his he can keep them or her for himself he can sell her he can give her to somebody else it's like an object women have no shares in the inheritance so Islam gradually removed all these uh, cultural practices and instated the monotheistic practices and instated for women rights they never dreamt of they were not even available in any advanced civilization before or even as of today believe it or not likewise with the slaves the nature of the Prophet of Islam Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he was naturally kind forbearing merciful then when he was commissioned with the prophethood, he has become the most kind. He has become the most merciful, the most forbearing person. And the Almighty Allah crowned him with this beautiful title in Surah Al-Anbiya. In ayah number 107, he said, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have not sent you but as mercy for whom? For the existence whether the human beings including your friends your enemies your followers non-believers your mercy for everyone your mercy for animals your mercy for plants your mercy for nature and uh, we've talked a lot in the past about uh, how his mercy how his mercy sallallahu alaihi wasallam is so vast that it covered all of that and we'll give you examples so before he was commissioned with the prophethood when he married to this very wealthy woman Khadija radiallahu anha the wealthiest woman in, uh, in Mecca whom everyone dreamt of marrying and she would turn down all the proposals because she knew that they are after her money she was beautiful and rich meanwhile but she chose Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam because of his honesty he is handsome he is uh, adorned with the most beautiful traits so she decided to marry him and when they got married she gave him a gift and the gift was a slave take this slave so that he will help you carry your stuff and you know follow you here and there okay his name was Zaid Zaid ibn Haritha when the people the family of Zaid ibn Haritha heard that their son is still alive but he is enslaved and he was sold so many times and he ended up with a good family now he is owned by a super nice and a gentleman by the name Muhammad so they came down to Mecca they visited with Muhammad all of that before he was even commissioned with the Nubuwa with the prophethood and they said you know what happened is your slave is actually our son and we will learn shortly inshallah how he ended up and how the slaves ended up being slaves while uh, they were free people okay so what do you want you name the price because he's a slave so uh, he's like an item he's for sale you can sell him you can buy slaves from the market there are markets where you can buy slaves from Okay, you check them out, men and women, young and old, and buy as many as you want, as long as you can afford it. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam listened to them and he gave them a better offer. He said, what about if I give you a better offer? Keep your money, 
just go talk to him. And if he's interested, he's free. Let him go with you, and I'm not taking any money from you. They were so delighted. They were flying out of joy and delight. And obviously, that's a done deal. Hey, son, you're free. Let's go to Zaid. The father and the uncle said, you know, your master freed you. You can just join us. He said, but I don't want to. Why not? You're going to see your mother. You're going to see your brothers and sisters. You're going to go to your family. You'll be a free man. You know, you're going to have slaves. He said, no, um, I'd like to stay with this man. I love him. Again, that was before Muhammad وسلم, was even appointed or commissioned with the Nubuwa. At that, they were shocked. What would make a slave like to remain in slavery and prefer that over going home with his family and enjoying the freedom? It must be the very unique treatment that he experienced from his master or the man who at that time possessed him. So he chose to stay with Muhammad وسلم, as a slave. When that happened, the Prophet وسلم, appreciated that from him and he decided to reward him. So he went to the Kaaba and in front of the Kaaba were normally people whenever they wanted to make a significant announcement, they will make it in front of the Kaaba. Then he said, Ya Ahl Mecca, O people of Mecca, you guys all bear witness that Zaid is a free man from now on. He is not a slave. You should not treat him as a slave. I freed him. Okay, this is before Islam, before he was commissioned with the prophethood. And not only that, he rewarded him. He said, and I adopted him. So Zaid has become my son. Zaid changed his name to Zaid, the son of Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Zaid was the happiest person in the whole world. Then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commissioned Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa with the prophethood, and he became an Abi, and gradually after the first and the second stages of da'wah, the secret da'wah, the public da'wah, where the slaves were being tortured, most of those who followed Prophet Muhammad and believed in him were the people who don't have power, who don't have authority, unlike the chieftains of Mecca, the weak, the poor. So they followed him, they liked his message. Okay, so their masters put a lot of pressure on them in order to convert them back to paganism. They refused. And you know, they were slaves, so their masters could simply kill them, and there is no penalty. That was the norms before Islam as well. A master can kill his slave or her a slave, and no one would blame them. No one would ask, why did you do so? There is no penalty. I own him, like any object. So those companions who were slaves and accepted Islam have been tortured. Like Bilal ibn Rabah and the Suhaib al Rumi, uh, Khabbab ibn al Arat, and you were all aware of what happened to the family of Yasser and his wife and their son, Ammar ibn Yasser, and Ammar's parents, Yasser and Sumayya, were both martyred when they were killed brutally under torture and due to torture. Abu Bakr Siddiq was Prophet Muhammad's best friend even before he became a prophet. And he was a merchant and he used to have some money. So he would go to the masters, the owners of those slaves, and he would offer to buy them. Then when he buys them, he would even sometimes pay, uh, pay double and triple the price. Then he would free them. So his father said, Ya Bunay, huh? He said, why don't you buy the powerful slaves? At least they can help you in business and trade. And he said, my father, I'm not buying them to possess them. I'm buying them to free them. So he purchased Bilal ibn Rabah and he paid more than what his master was asking for. And he freed him for the sake of Allah. Okay. And many others. Then when they migrated to uh, Medina, a new set of rules started evolving. I'd like to share with you initially what were the resources of slavery worldwide before and before the Islamic legislation started. Number one, it was 
wars. So whenever a tribe or an army attacks another town or city or village, they take everyone, when they defeat them, they take everyone as slaves. But this woman has a wife, uh, the kids belong to a free man, whether he's a chieftain, whether he's, uh, everybody will become their slaves. Okay, even it is not just fight war, it's like raiding another nation or another tribe or peacefully living, then they just attack them, they took their wealth and they took them into slavery. The second is kidnapping. The caravans which will be traveling uh, for trade and business, whether to Asham in summer or uh, to Yemen in winter, they feared most not only capturing their caravans and stealing and robbing their goods and their wealth, but also themselves, they will be taken and put into slavery. Men, women, old, young, everyone. And the third, the penalties and the punishment for certain crimes, like murder, stealing, uh, somebody is caught with a crime. So this person's punishment was to put him into slavery. He is not free man anymore. There is another resource which was inability of settling a debt. Somebody borrowed money for a reason or another. He was desperately in need. I will pay you a, a year from now. He failed to pay. He failed to come up with the interest, the riba. So the creditor will possess the borrower, the debtor. He will become his slave or her slave because he failed to make the payment. The father, actually, not only that he was a family guardian and a family father, but he also possessed his children. So you have all the right to sell any of his children whenever and whichever way he likes and to whomever he wills. Then the offspring of the slaves automatically become slaves. It was a big mess. So basically, whoever will get into the vicious cycle of slavery, not a chance to come out of it. Then, when Islam came, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started setting set of rules and regulations in order to limit and dry up the resources for slavery and open many doors for the freedom of the slaves. This chapter is talking about that. And this is very crucial, brothers and sisters. It is not possible for anyone to believe even in their own religion to love their own messenger, to honor and respect the Quran, unless if they know what is it all about, if they study it. Whenever there is a misconception that is raised, so you say, yeah, how come there is slavery in Islam? Did not bother to ask. If you were to ask, you will be very pleased. You will be the happiest person to recognize that you're following the ultimate truth and there is no other truth but this religion. That is the only religion that the Almighty Allah prescribed for His servants and accepted from them. Inna dina and Allah al-Islam. And if this is the case, then all the legislations, the instructions, the do's and do not do's are divine. And from whom? Hakim, Khabir. Tanzilum min Hakim, Khabir. The one who is full of wisdom, the source of hikmah, the Almighty Allah. Khabir fully aware and well acquainted of everything, of what is beneficial for his servants. What will bring them peace of mind and a happy life is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَلَا يَعْلَمُ مَنْ خَلَقَ وَهُوَ اللَّطِيفُ الْخَبِيرُ So enjoy learning about your deen. Spare some time. You find first with regards to the first source of slavery, which is war. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم in ayah number four, فَإِمَّا مَنَّمْ بَعْدُ وَإِمَّا فِدَاء حَتَّى تَضَعَ الْحَرْبُ أَوْزَارَهَا يعني in case that you fought against the enemies, the non-believers, so you killed some of them and you've taken prisoners of war, some of them, then you have the choice. مَنَّمْ يعني to free them without any ransom, huh? without any compensation. وَإِمَّا فِدَاء or you accept the ransom based on your judgment. Use your best judgment. Allah is giving you the choice on the battle of Badr. And the battle of Badr, Badr al-Kubra, particularly 
was something unprecedented for many, many reasons. Number one, that the, it was the first serious confrontation between the Muslim party, the believers party who have been persecuted, uh, killed, their wealth have been confiscated uh, for years, 13, 14 years. And the tyrants, the chieftains of Mecca driving an army of 1,000, okay? So Alhamdulillah, the small party defeated the huge party. They killed seven of them, and they've taken many of the chieftains of Mecca as prisoners of war. And they can afford, and those who cannot afford, the Prophet ﷺ, look how he dealt with them. And I'm just asking you to imagine, after 13 years in Mecca, then chasing them for another couple years, we're talking about 15 years of constant torture and suffering. The torture and harassment reached the level of killing some of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Okay? Istad'af. Now, those tyrant guys are under our control. They are our slaves according to the inland national law. They wouldn't be doing anything wrong. They have taken them as slaves. But the Prophet ﷺ freed them. If you pay ransom, and if you don't, the ransom was, in many cases, you know how to read and write? Well, teach a few Muslims how to read and write. Then you're free. You go home. That's it. Umar al Khattab was of the opinion that, you know, we've suffered a lot out of those people. We can bury them in bunkers underground. we we'll put them in Guantanamo uh, or a concentration camp or Abu Ghraib prison, uh, sexually molesting them, um, film videos of, uh, you know, uh, sexually molesting them and raping them. We can make fun of them, right? No, 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 that's not permissible. That's not permissible because we are not like those evil people. They are pure evil. We are Muslims or believers. So no matter what happens, you're not allowed to do any of that. You still respect them even though they are your enemies, you know? Subhanallah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders us to treat them with the kind treatment. So slavery was common, yet the Prophet ﷺ freed them. And that is the ayah, the reference, ayah number four of Surah Muhammad. ﷺ. Obviously, they have the right to also take prisoners of war as slaves because Allah the Almighty says. فَمَنِ اعْتَدَى عَلَيْكُمْ فَاعْتَدُوا عَلَيْهِ بِمِثْلِ مَا اعْتَدَى عَلَيْكُمْ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَ الْمُتَّقِينَ This is a mutual treatment. You guys take slaves, so we take slaves. You know? We come to an agreement, whether you call it the Geneva Convention or the International Agreement or the United Nations Resolution, as long as you respect my prisoners of war, I will treat yours likewise. Okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter number 5, ayah number 8, and This is the ayah which Harvard University acknowledged as the most perfect when it comes to justice. Allah the Almighty says, let not the enmity of certain people make you mistreat them or be unjust and unfair to them. Even though they are your enemies, but still there is law and order. And who puts the law? Americans can change the law in a minute. Any country, any regime, any dictator can simply change the law in a minute. So they can come up with a Patriot Act. Okay, what, what is supposed to mean? I mean, we decide that there is a citizen of the country, but due to some secret evidences, which we're not going to reveal. So we have the right to send a drone to kill that person here or there without even consulting anyone. There is no law and order. Yani, I make the law and I have all the right to ignore it, uh, shred it and trash it because I am the law. No. In Islam, this is not the case. 
in Islam there is a divine law which even the messenger of Allah must abide with it. He doesn't have the right to ignore it or to abrogate it or to neglect it. لا يجرمنكم شنآن قوم على أن لا تعدلوا اعدلوا هو أقرب للتقوى Then we find in the Quran and in the sound sunnah how the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم ordered the kind treatment of the prisoners of war when he said feed them from whatever you eat and he did that with Thumama ibn Uthal one of his worst enemies. And after three days, Thumama ibn Uthal came willingly to accept Islam. That's after the Prophet ﷺ set him free and he left from Medina. He returned back willingly and he became a servant of the Prophet ﷺ willingly. And he said that, I do not love anyone in this entire life as much as I love you. Even though three days ago, he said, I never hated anyone as much as I hated you. The Prophet ﷺ, considered feeding the prisoners of war one of the great acts of worship which you will be rewarded for a great deal similar to taking care of the orphans the poor the widows and so on and when it comes to in case that you still have any slaves or servants the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in the sound hadith which is uh, collected by imam muslim he said, لا يقول أن أحدكم عبدي وآمتي You should never say my slave, my servant, male or female. We're all the servants of Allah. We're all the slaves of God. Rather you should say, O Lami wa Jariyati. So I say to my teenage boy, to my young kids, Ulam. Ulam in Arabic doesn't only mean a slave. It also means a young boy. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu an says, I was once riding behind the Prophet sallallahu on the same mount and he said, Ya ghulam, inni u'allimuka kalimat. He called him ghulam because he was about 13 years old, a teenager. So ghulam means a young boy. Jariya means a young girl. Okay? So you should not call your servant as or your slave that was when there was slavery. You should not call them my slave or my servant. Nowadays, don't call it my maid. Huh? Rather, the domestic helper, that sounds better, my assistant, right? You, you're going to be amazed when you hear the rest of the divine and the prophetic instructions in this regard. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam received the revelation from Allah in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4 and number 36. Allah the Almighty says, وَاعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا وَبِذِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَى وَالْمَسَاكِينِ وَالْجَارِذِ الْقُرْبَى وَالْجَارِ الْجُنُوبِ وَالصَّاحِبِ بِالْجَنْبِ وَبِنِ السَّبِيلِ وَمَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ مَنْ كَانَ مُخْتَلًا فخور. So Allah after commanding monotheism and worshipping Allah alone and not associating with him any in worship, he said, and you must be kind and dutiful to parents, orphans, poor, neighbors, Muslims and non-Muslims, relatives and those who have nothing to do with the, your family and the wayfarers and your he did not say slaves he said Ma malakat aymanukum, and what your hand right hand possess indeed Allah does not like the arrogant the boastful ones the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith man qadhafa mamlukahu wa huwa bari'un mimma qal julida yawm al qiyamah it's a sound hadith collected by Imam Bukhari. Not because you owned a slave back then. Hmm? Again, when that was the norms. Uh, the, yani, you have the right to do whatever you want to do. And as you wish with your slave. No, even falsely accusing your servant with anything, with any guilt. Which you know that he is free from. You will be whipped and lashed by Allah on the day of judgment. But he is my slave. We say not slave. He is your brother. She is your sister. 
He is a domestic helper. He is a ghulam or a jariah. Still some more to address inshallah in this regard. But I would like to take a short break and we'll be back in a few minutes. Please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to the second segment in today's episode of Gardens of the Pious. My dear respected viewers, I'd like to begin the segment by making dua and asking all of you to join me to make dua for the Muslim community in India. Unfortunately, uh, a state of unrest is happening there due to the uh, Indian uh, fascist mob attacking and killing Muslims and burning some of their places of worship. And uh, as usual, um, you know, the international community is deaf and blind because the victims are Muslims. And as usual, you do not find the Muslim rulers or the Muslim countries uh, lifting a finger or objecting or making any threat to cut ties or uh, you know to reduce the, the trade with the perpetrators but we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on all of us we ask Allah to support and help our Muslim brothers and sisters in India and bring peace to their country and unite the people once again as co-citizens and um, hopefully, inshallah, they will get rid of the fascist regimes which is igniting fitna in the country. It is very unfortunate, but Allah is the greatest and the most effective means and the sharpest weapon that Muslims have is invoking their God, invoking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is Al-Qadir and He is able to do all things. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, I'm requesting you to include uh, the Muslims in India uh, in your prayer may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring peace to them protect them and secure them and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take care of the enemies and the perpetrators who are trying their best to fuel the conflict in India may Allah bring peace to India at large Ameen Barakallahu uh, Feekum Sister Khadija from Canada Assalamu Alaikum Wa Alaikum Assalamu Alaikum uh, my friend gave me the number. I have a couple questions. We had a dis discussion about something. It's about the prayer and the fast thing. And the prayer, I was telling her that, like, uh, let's say sometime we go out and it's time for us to pray. At that time, we're not home. So let's say the uh, four, uh, two, uh, 12 o'clock prayer. Um, yeah, 2 o'clock pray prayer. At that time, you're outside. By the time you come home, it's about to pray for like uh, the one at 4 o'clock. So I was asking her, which one do you pray first? Whether the one you miss or the one that is about to come right now? She told me that you have to pray the one is about to come before you pray the one that you miss. I said, oh, I asked a couple people. They told me you have to do the one that you miss first before you do the other one. So that's when she gave me this number to call you guys and ask you okay. the question. Maybe I can get an answer from you guys. Okay. First of all, yeah. Sister Khadija, if you want to hang up, fine. If you want to stay on the phone, you may do that. First of all, whenever I'm out for shopping or whatever, this is not an excuse to miss the Dhuhri prayer. So I should do my best to pray on time before the time of the next prayer. Some circumstances where it is not possible to pray outside. I don't have a place to pray. You may join the two prayers together with this intention. But keeping the order is a must. So I'm not allowed to pray Asr, then pray Dhuhr. Which means if I came home and it's already Asr time, or even I went to the masjid and they're praying Asr and I haven't prayed Dhuhr yet, you will join the jama'ah with the intention of praying dhuhr because dhuhr comes first. 
So maintaining the order of the prayer is a must. And it's a condition for the validity. You cannot pray Asr, then go back to pray Dhuhr. Uh, Barakallahu Fiki, Sister Khadija from Canada. And you're most welcome as a new viewer to the program. Now, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made it very clear when it comes to, you know, giving and granting the slaves rights like the free, exactly like their masters. Imagine, we said before that if a master killed his slave, he's not blameworthy. Who's going to account him? Who's going to penalize him? No one. But in Islam and under the umbrella of the Sharia, the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ قَتَلَ عَبْدَهُ قَتَلْنَاهُ وَمَنْ جَدَعَهُ جَدَعْنَاهُ In the sound hadith. Whoever happened to kill deliberately his servant, then the equality and punishment will be applied to him. He will be killed as a result. You break his nose, you, we break your nose. Oh, not only that, he forbade stretching out your hand to slap the servant or the slave. And he said the ransom for that is to free him or her. When a man happened to slap his jariah, his slave back then, and he came to the Prophet and said, set her free that is the ransom for slapping the slave this is like a dream that no ever no one ever dreamt of having any by law or constitution that would grant the slaves such rights before that was islam almost for 1500 years ago assalamu alaikum sister fatima from pakistan assalamu alaikum yes Alaikum assalam. First of all, Sheikh, Nazakallah khairan for all your lectures and especially your lecture at Lahore. At Al Huda, that was a very beautiful lecture. Thank you, sister. Jazakallah khairan. Go ahead if you have any questions. Okay, my, quest my question is that I am again confused regarding istikhara that if a person is unable to make a decision between two choices. For example, a man has been offered two houses and he is not able to decide which house should he buy. Can he make istikhara for this purpose? Okay, any other questions? Another question is that sometimes I get so much regular in praying all the sunnah prayers, but after a month or two, I leave them all and I get very lazy in praying the sunnah prayers. So can you tell me any guidelines and tips on how to be persistent in sunnah prayers as we are in the obligatory prayers? All right. Thank you, Sister Thank Fatima you. from Pakistan. First of all, with regards to your question about uh, praying istikhara before buying a house to choose between two houses, it is actually highly recommended to pray istikhara to consult Allah before you make such a decision. Because the Prophet said, إذا هم أحدكم بالأمر فليركع ركعتين من دون الفريضة ثم ليقل. So whenever you're about to decide any decision, to make any decision which is something serious, like marriage, like study, traveling, buying or selling, you know, even though you feel like, you know, I love this house more, I'm obsessed with this house. No, before you pay the money or the down payment, pray istikhara. Because there are a lot of things that you could be unaware of. Only Allah the Almighty knows them. So consulting Allah, the one who knows everything and he is well acquainted of everything, even what is hidden, will guide you to the best choice. And this is something that Muslims are the luckiest people that they have a chance to ask Allah directly and consult him. So what do you think? Is this house better or that house? A girl is having two or three proposals. Is this guy better or that guy or this person? You pray istikhara before you make the decision. As far as, you know, feeling lazy sometimes and skipping some of the sunan, obviously we are as human beings, we have the human nature of tending to forget nasiya and the word insan, which means a human being, is derived from the term nisyan, which is forgetfulness. So that's why Allah the Almighty said in Surah al dhariyat وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَ تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Keep reminding because the reminder will benefit the believers. 
So whenever you log in or you fetch one of those episodes, which in Adriyah Abdul Salihin as well, where we spoke about the virtues of the Nawafil, the Sunnah prayer. And I think a couple of weeks ago on my page, I went live where I discussed the magnitude reward for praying the Nawafil before and after and so on. So when I remind myself with that, and I know that by offering this, I get closer to Allah. It remits so much of my sins. It makes up any deficiency and shortcoming that took place in my fard namaz. All of that will encourage me to keep up with the nawafil again and even do more. Barakallahu fiki, sister Fatima from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum. Uwais from the USA. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam, Shaykh. Uh, good to talk to you. May Allah give you the full reward, uh, what you do for the Ummah. I had a question, Shaykh. Yes. Uh, my question is about uh, the four madahib. Uh, and the question is that do we uh, bound to or how much we have to obey one, I mean, follow one madhab, especially in the U.S. I understand back home that you um, it's better to follow one madhab, but uh, what about here in the U.S.? Uh, do we need to follow one madhab or we can just, you know, uh, do whatever okay. is authentic? Jazakallah so just, Got your yeah, question. Also. To know what you say about that. Sure. Uh, w generally speaking, w when we answer this question, we distinguish between laymen and specialized people. Like, alhamdulillah, if you study Sharia and you study different madhahib, then it is not sufficient to stay, I stick to one madhab and that's it. What if you know that this opinion in the madhab that you're adopting is marjuha, or it is not really the right opinion for a reason or another, then you should not follow it blindly because you know, you know. So you're supposed to follow what is authentic and what is right. And tracing back, the views of the founders of those madahib and others, they themselves confirmed that if you find a correct hadith proving another opinion to be right or more right, then disregard my opinion. And this is the true knowledge. So for the specialists, for the shiuch, for the ulama, you know, they study those madahib in order to give you the nectar. So the layman, you know, if you follow a madhab, if you follow your local imam, you're not blameworthy, you're perfectly fine, okay? Because it is not your duty to study fiqh, to be specialized in comparative fiqh. You're a doctor, you're a business owner, you're an engineer, you're a math teacher. You just need to know the basics in order to learn how to pray fast, give your zakah. Further questions, you consult your local imam, okay? Now, alhamdulillah, it's so easy to ask, the really very well versed scholars uh, in the USA there is Dr. Salah Al-Sawi, there is Sheikh Walid Al-Basuni, there are Sheikh Walid Al-Minaisi and many others. You pick up the phone or you go to their websites or you call Ask Uda, and you will find the answer insha'Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Maya from the USA. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, I apologize. Uh, like a month ago, I have called about, about um, a question concerning the, um, the making up of three days. Yes. But the answer you gave me, I don't know, maybe I might have misunderstood it. Um, like uh, a few weeks ago, the three days, I couldn't make it. So, and then I had to travel. Then I came back, so I'm trying to catch them up. But while catching them up, one of the days, uh, match it is with a Monday and a Thursday. And I wanted to know if they do, um, how to say it, if they do match on a Monday on a Thursday, so does it mean that after again, I have to make up for that Monday and that Thursday? Okay, stay on the phone, sister. I don't know Maya. if I'm not clear. Can, can, I'm not can, sure if, she, uh, if I'm you're clear. clear. You're clear. Are you, okay, okay. Can, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, stay on the phone, please. First of all, uh, you know, you guys are not paying anything for the phone call. Alhamdulillah, shukrillah. 
Uh, first of all, you're asking about the three days which their fasting is voluntary. So it's sunnah. It's not a must. But you're fasting them because of the magnificent reward which will give you the reward of fasting for the whole month. As if you've been fasting for 30 days. So I was traveling. I didn't get to fast on either 13th or 14th or the three days. Can I fast on any other three days? Yes, that is permissible. And the mission will be accomplished. Well, due to traveling and getting sick, you know, I kept them to the end of the month. And accordingly, I fasted and it was Monday and it was Thursday. No problem. As long as you don't single Friday by fasting by itself then you can fast on any other day. Stay away from single and Friday and Saturday by fasting, the voluntary fasting. But if you fast on Monday and uh, you have the habit of fasting on Monday, like including making up, not just the sunnah, the fard, you get the reward of making up the day that you missed in addition to the reward for observing fasting on Monday. Because fasting on Mondays and Thursdays is a sunnah as the Prophet ﷺ used to do and he instructed us. Furthermore, so you don't have to call again for this particular uh, question. The whole month I've been traveling, I have headache, migraine, I was busy, I didn't get to fast any voluntary fasting during this month of Jumada, Al Awwal, Al Thani, or whatever. Now we started Rajab. Can I make up? those three days or whatever voluntary fasting that I missed from the previous month. In this month, yes ma'am, you may do that and you will receive the reward for it, insha'Allah. Barakallah feekum. We didn't get to finish the topic that we started and uh, I was contemplating the idea of not taking any calls but you know, I, I feel bad if I do that. So we ran out of time, but to be continued, inshallah, and I hope you can connect the dots so that inshallah next time, which will be on Monday next week, inshallah, we'll continue with the same chapter of the merits of freeing the slaves in Islam. It will be the third episode, and I hope you will remember what we discussed today, so that inshallah we'll pick it up from there and we'll take it off from where we stopped uh, today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for all of us to learn his deen, to prosper, to be righteous, to keep us all steadfast on the straight path. May Allah support our brothers and sisters in India, spare them, give them courage, steadfastness, protect them, and uh, give them health and wealth and make them um, protected. Ameen, ameen, ameen. Likewise, in Kashmir, in Burma, in Syria, and all over the world. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. He only humans to be the best and give his best religion to them. Allah our God is the greatest. The one and only glory to him. He only humans to be the best and give his best religion to them. So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about him in paradise. Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell and paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price